Hi, this is a voice annotated presentation on the use of sustained release dinoprostone vaginal insert compared to repeated or intermittent prostaglandin administration in terms of efficacy and safety in pre induction of labor. Firstly, we will have a short introduction about induction of labor and mechanisms of cervical ripening. We will then be discussing a systematic review and meta analysis comparing the efficacy of sustained release dinoprostone insert versus repeated prostaglandin administration, which will include a brief comparison with other meta-analyses. Induction of labor is defined as the initiation of labor by artificial means before its spontaneous onset, with the aim of achieving delivery in a pregnant woman. In order for labor to occur, cervical changes must happen. Firstly, cervical ripening occurs, which is a prelude to the onset of labor, whereby the cervix becomes soft and compliant. This allows its shape to change from being long and closed to being thinned out or effaced and starting to dilate. The condition or ripeness of the cervix influences the success of in inducing labor. Thus, cervical examination is essential before labor induction. The Bishop score is used to assess the cervix using parameters such as dilatation, effacement, consistency, position, as well as station of the fetal presentation. This is to predict, predict the success of labor induction. A score of 5 or less means that the cervix is considered unripe, and thus the chance of success from labor induction will benefit from cervical ripening before induction. In addition to these parameters, one point is added to the overall score for preeclampsia and for each prior vaginal delivery. One point is subtracted off the overall score for post-date pregnancy, no prior births, premature or prolonged rupture of membranes. Now you will talk about some mechanisms involved in cervical ripening. Cervical ripening is a chronic process whereby the cervix undergoes extensive progressive changes throughout pregnancy. It is also a remodeling process in which biochemical cascades, interactions between cellular and extracellular components, as well as the involvement of inflammatory cells. All these processes serve to soften, dilate, and efface the cervix. Cervical ripening is mediated by prostaglandins, which are endogenous compounds found in the myometrium, decidua, and fetal membranes during pregnancy. At term, cervical production of prostaglandins increase. In particular, PGE2, or dinoprostone, administration modulates fibroblast activity and acts as chemotactic agents to cause inflammatory cells to be attracted and release degradative enzymes and cause cervical ripening. To be more specific, the increase in elastase and proteoglycans in the cervix causes a relaxation of cervical smooth muscles to facilitate di dilation. Prostaglandins also cause an increase in intracellular calcium levels, thus increasing the contraction of myometrial muscles. Finally, there is a dissolution of college bundles and an increase in the submucosal water content of the cervix, causing softening. According to the NICE Clinical Guideline 70, which was issued in 2008 and updated this year, vaginal PGE2, or dinoprostone, is the preferred method of induction of labor, unless there are specific clinical reasons for not using it, in particular, the risk of uterine hyperstimulation. It should be administered as a gel, tablet, or controlled release pessary. We will now discuss a systematic review and meta-analysis comparing a specific delivery method of PGE2 or dinoprostone via sustained release vaginal insert with repeated prostaglandin administration via other modes. In this study, randomized controlled trials comparing the effects of sustained release PGE2 with repeated prostaglandin administration were chosen. Inclusion criteria for the RCTs were firstly, data reported separately according to parity, which is nulliparous and or multiparous. Secondly, women with unfavorable cervix or Bishop's score of less than 5 
And finally, women with intact membranes. The primary efficacy outcome that the authors were interested in was cesarean section rate. The secondary efficacy outcomes were vaginal delivery, vaginal delivery within 12 hours or 24 hours, oxytocin augmentation, instrumental delivery, induction to delivery interval, and hospitalization length. The primary safety outcome investigated was uterine hyperstimulation requiring immediate delivery. On all the randomized control trials that were included, a quality assessment was carried out with regards to the following criteria. Each study was graded as inadequate, adequate, or unclear for each criteria. In all, seven randomized controlled trials were chosen for inclusion in the systematic review and meta-analysis, with a total sample size of 911 women. Three out of the seven studies had data for both multiparous and nonniparous women, while the other four only had data for nonniparous women. The insert treatment was either 12 hours or 24 hours of sustained release PGE2, followed by various interventions. The control treatment was also highly varied, with many different regimens of repeated prostaglandin administration, which was either dinoprostone or misoprostol. Now let's talk about some results. In Nale Paris women, the sustained release vaginal insert was found to reduce the cesarean re section rate by 24% compared to other ways of prostaglandin administration. However, in multiparous women, there was no statistically significant difference between the sustained release vaginal insert and other ways of PG administration. On the whole, including both nonniparous and multiparous women, there was a 23% reduction in C-section rate for the vaginal insert as compared to the other ways of administration. Regarding the primary safety outcome of uterine hyperstimulation, the vaginal insert resulted in a two-fold increase in the risk of uterine hyperstimulation in nulliparous women as compared to the other ways of prostaglandin administration. In multiparous women, the difference between the vaginal insert and other ways of administration was not statistically significant for uterine hyperstimulation. Again, combining the data from nulliparous and multiparous women, there is an overall two-fold increase in the risk of uterine hyperstimulation when comparing the sustained release vaginal insert to other ways of prostaglandin administration. Finally, these are the results for the other secondary outcomes. There seems to be an increase in the rate of vaginal deliveries associated with the use of vaginal insert compared to the other ways, but the association is not very statistically significant. There is also a statistically significant decrease in the usage of oxytocin augmentation associated with the use of vaginal insert versus the other ways of prostaglandin administration. The authors performed this meta-analysis to determine the best approach for prostaglandin induction of labor in the most challenging population, which is nulliparous women with very unprepared cervix and intact membranes. The results of the meta-analysis suggest that the sustained release vaginal insert performs better than repeated prostaglandin administration since it is associated with more vaginal deliveries and less oxytocin use. However, the use of vaginal insert is also associated with more uterine hyperstimulation. Nevertheless, this is the first time that the vaginal insert shows a protective effect towards the cesarean section rate in nulliparous women. This effect is not seen in multiparous women. A sustained release vaginal insert also affords some advantages in management, which are an avoidance of an unnecessary examination due to the reduced frequency of medication administration. Uh, this allows patients to be more comfortable and relaxed. In addition, while the sustained release insert is higher in cost than a single dose of other prostaglandin preparations, the repeated dosing in the control regimens 
means that the sustained release insert is more cost effective for the patient. So according to this meta-analysis, vaginal insert releasing dinoprostone or PGA2 should thus be employed for those women where induction of labor is expected to be less responsive in terms of time to labor onset as well as requiring repeated stimulations, for example, in non women. Now we will talk about some advantages and limitations of the study. The study design of a meta-analysis increases the available sample size by combining studies, thus increasing the power to study desired clinical outcomes. In addition, this specific study stratifies the data according to parity and Bishop score, which has not been done in previous studies, thus combining very heterogeneous clinical conditions. Some limitations of the study include, firstly, the C-section rate may not be the best indicator of successful induction of labor. Some of the other meta-analyses that we will mention later had primary outcomes such as vaginal delivery and initiation of labor, which may be a better indicator of successful induction of labor. There is also a potential conflict of interest on the part of the authors since the company Faring Italy provided a grant to the statisticians and Faring makes uh, the sustained release PGE2 inserts. Finally, the included studies are of variable quality and include a very heterogeneous range of insert and control regimens. Now we will mention briefly results from a few other meta-analyses. The first is Hughes et al. 2001, which is a meta-analysis comparing 10 mg controlled release dinoprostone vaginal insert over 12 hours versus other forms of prostaglandin or oxytocin gels of differing dosage or schedule of gel administration. Some of the main outcomes are, firstly, regarding vaginal delivery within 12 hours, the control performed better than the insert. And regarding initiation of labor, the control again performed better than the insert. Finally, regarding C-section rates and uterine hyperstimulation, there was no significant difference found in the two groups. Some of the limitations of the study include the heterogeneity of the studies used in the meta-analysis. Also, the meta-analysis significant results might be confounded by one definitive study which showed positive results. Another meta-analysis by Austin et al. in 2010 compared sustained release dinoprostone insert with intermittent vaginal administration of misoprostol tablets. Here are some of the main outcomes. Regarding vaginal delivery, the misoprostol performs better than the insert. Regarding the use of oxytocin augmentation, the misoprostol again performs better than the insert. Finally, in cesarean section rate, uterine hyperstimulation, fetal tachycystole and neonatal outcomes, there were no significant differences found in the two groups. Some of the limitations of this study are that nulliparous patients have been analyzed together with multiparous ones, and Bishop's score at entry was poorly stratified. Finally, according to the Cochrane Reviews in 2009, Sustained release PG, PGE2 insert is associated with, firstly, a reduction in instrumental vaginal deliveries compared to vaginal PGE2 gel or tablets. So the effect is greater in women with unfavorable cervix. Secondly, there is a reduction in use of oxytocin augmentation compared to the gel. Finally, there is increased uterine hyperstimulation with or without fetal heart rate changes compared to gel or tablets. Also, no evidence of difference uh, exists between sustained release PGE2 inserts and the gel or tablet in cesarean section rates and neonatal outcomes. In the 2014 Cochrane Review, there is no evidence of difference between the various PGE2 delivery systems, whether gel, tablet, or controlled release pessary. In conclusion, this is a summary of the studies that we have talked about with a list of some of the outcomes investigated in the studies. As we have mentioned previously, the first study that we were discussing, 
shows for the first time that the vaginal insert performs better in terms of cesarean section rates and oxytocin augmentation, especially in non-parous women. The earlier Hughes and Austin studies showed that the repeated prostaglandin administration performs better in different criteria. Finally, the Cochrane review also shows that the insert performs better in terms of need for oxytocin augmentation. However, the review in 2014 shows that there is no statistically significant difference between the different uh, modes of delivery of PGE2. We have now come to the end of our presentation. These are some of the references that we used. Thank you for listening.